What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content here on my channel, then make sure you hit the like button, and make sure you hit subscribe so you can help decide what direction the content on my channel goes in, in the foreseeable future. So Superior Iron Man is like one of the best stories ever. And it's hilarious because like you guys have been screaming at me to do Superior Iron Man. Like, Rob, we need the Superior Iron Mans. <laughs> and it's, it's pretty funny to me. It's pretty interesting because it really is just a great story. Now, here's the deal. A Superior Iron Man comes out of two things. The first thing is the second wave of Marvel Now. And the other one is Axis. Now, we haven't done Axis yet. And really, the only motivation for me to do Axis was to lead into Superior Iron Man. So I'll leave it on you guys. I mean, Axis is, is a pretty cool story. It's, it's interesting up to a point. But with Axis, it basically dealt with the aftermath of Avengers versus X-Men. Remember, in Avengers versus X-Men, we basically ended up seeing Cyclops as really in possession of part of the Phoenix Force, killing Charles Xavier. Now, what this did is it basically sent, uh, sent Professor X in sort of this no man's land in the sense that what ended up happening is that Red Skull basically took the brain of Charles Xavier and then rechristened himself as Onslaught. He basically had Charles Xavier's abilities. Of course, there were other things going on, like creating concentration camps, things like that. But the idea was that in order for uh, Red Skull to be defeated, there was actually a spell that was cast by Doctor Strange and Scarlet Witch. And what this did is it basically inverted people's moral compasses. So good guys became bad guys, bad guys became good guys. In the instance of Tony Stark, his comic book character basically became Tony Stark from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. <laughs> That's essentially what happened. Now, the funny thing about this is that when the spell was reversed again, basically meaning that people will return back to the way that they were supposed to be, Iron Man shielded himself. And so the result was that when everybody went back to normal, Tony Stark stayed being a jerk. Now, the reason why Marvel did this is because at the end of the run of Iron Man that we had just finished, so the whole thing with like God Killer Armor and Arno Stark, the secret brother of Tony Stark, different things like that, Marvel had about 12 months between the end of that story, the end of that run, and the start of all new, all different Marvel. And the idea was that with Secret Wars coming, Marvel was basically winding down stories. That's why you saw things like the last days of uh, of different characters, the last days of Asgard, the last days of like the Punisher, different things like that. And so what Marvel did is instead of just crafting this, you know, grandiose story with Tony Stark and last days, different things like that. Instead, Tom Taylor was brought on board and just gave us like this short run of, uh, of, of uh, Iron Man where he was basically just a jerk. And it's amazing. So, <laughs> so with all that exposition out of the way, again, what this does is it actually picks up with San Francisco. Now, this really just kind of follows Tony Stark moving from New York to San Francisco proper, and he actually takes up residence at Alcatraz. But it initially picks up with uh, with She-Hulk facing against some villain named Teen, Teen Abomination, which is kind of a weird scenario. But of course, when Iron Man's head gets knocked off, people start to panic, only for us to find out that it's not actually Tony Stark himself. Instead, it's one of his autonomous suits. What we end up finding out is that he's partying with like a bunch of super hot chicks <laughs> back at his place. Now, of course, this leads into Pepper Potts. Now, one of the things that I want to talk about here for a second and we'll cover this a little bit more as we get into the next video, is something called Stark Resilient. But Stark Resilient was the Matt Fraction run of Iron Man, and we actually hadn't covered that. That was the run of Iron Man that took place before the one that we just did. And in truth, it's really like the aftermath to Civil War. So it's basically Tony Stark as director of S.H.I.E.L.D. Now, the idea here is that with Stark Resilient, it was basically Iron Man trying to quote unquote turn over a new leaf. It was Tony Stark back then basically saying, okay, I don't necessarily want to be the weapons manufacturer. What I want to do is I want to start creating products that can just make life better for the world. So when it comes to like the Marvel Cinematic Universe Iron Man, when it got to the point in the first film when he basically created the Iron Man armor, the actual real Iron Man armor, and then told Obadiah Stane he wanted to drop weapons manufacturing, that's basically that element of Matt Fraction's run rolled over into the movie. At least I'm pretty sure Matt Fraction's run happened before then, but Stark Resilient was a new name of that company. So it focused on new forms of technology, different things like that, phone development, so on and so forth. And all that served the purpose of just making the world a better place. Place. The issue was that Tony Stark, realizing that Pepper was a person who would always be in danger at his side, moved her away from Stark Industries and put her in Stark Resilient. And so they basically run two different companies. Now, the idea here is that with Pepper Potts basically running up on him, what we're introduced to is the new Iron Man armor, the Endosim armor. Now, this is probably one of the coolest suits ever. Like, it's, it's one of the coolest Iron Man armors ever. Not only does it just look amazing, but it's an armor that actually responds to the psychic control of Tony Stark. Now, again, that's not new. Extremist, the extremist suit did the exact same thing. But the whole idea here is that this is modeled and predicated on the Venom symbiote. Now, the Venom symbiote is basically the symbiote that is sentient. It does think for itself that works alongside the host. The 
idea here is that with this suit, Tony Stark as Iron Man can basically modify it in a litany of different ways. It basically serves the purpose of being an extension of himself. And so it just looks really awesome. Now, there are some perks to it that we haven't really seen before, and we'll actually see those as this video progresses. But again, this is really him just being a dick. What he had basically done is he had used this Extremis 3.0 app in order to give everybody in San Francisco the ability to be beautiful. Now, this is where we start coming out of the whole Arno Stark storyline. And that's the biggest issue with Superior Iron Man is at the end of our last run, when we had talked about the Rings of the Mandarin, different things like that, Arno Stark, the brother of Tony, had basically taken the Extremis technology and then modified it to essentially become something that could be used to like heal people. It was basically this like humanitarian technology. What Tony did is he took that Extremis tech from Arno and then he in turn modified it just for selfish means. And what he did is he distributed this app among the entire population of San Francisco, granting them what they perceived to be the perfect life, meaning they were all beautiful people. The problem with this is that the app only has a trial period. And when the trial period ends, they go back to looking like their normal selves. Well, this progresses exactly as we would think it would in the sense that people just start freaking out because for them, now it's like an addiction. Not only that, you have those who see themselves as beautiful and those who don't have the app. They don't have you know a phone to tap into it or whatever the case may be, but it's not activated for them. And so the result is that it's basically creating this social class, this social war among the various classes that exist. Now, of course, this also brings it to the equation, Daredevil. Now, historically speaking, Daredevil has almost always operated out of New York, but when writer Mark Wade took over with Daredevil Volume 3, with issue number 36 or 38, I believe, what he did is as part of the second rollout, the second phase of the original Marvel Now event, he basically moved Matt Murdock to San Francisco. And that basically saw the dissolution of Nelson and Murdock as a lawyer team. And so it essentially just kind of sent Matt Murdock back along his own way. But the idea was that with Mark Wade, it was changing things up. Now, again, Pepper Potts really kind of panics here. And that's the cool thing, because remember, in the Iron Man landscape, Pepper Potts is consistently the voice of reason. She's like the responsible parent and Tony Stark's just the irresponsible teenager. And so with this app race period ending, Iron Man is charging people $99 a day in order to be able to continue using this app. It's absolutely crazy. It's like an Apple product. So because of this, what we end up finding out is that somewhere along the line, the mind of Tony Stark was backed up in a digital form. What we actually end up doing here is taking this segment where we wind all the way back to like 1972 with Iron Man number 53. And I want to say all the way up to 1975 with Iron Man issue number 72. I'm not going to swear to that, but there was a villain that was named Black Llama. And of course, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but he was a guy that was created by a dude named Matt Friedrich. Essentially what had happened is that the mind of Tony Stark, or at least when Tony Stark had been defeated, because he was almost guaranteed death and escaped by the skin of his teeth, his mind was backed up. And so the result is that this is basically Pepper Potts talking to a earlier version of Iron Man. Now, of course, at the moment, we didn't know this. All we knew is that it was somebody donning the Iron Man suit. But because of the actions of Tony Stark in swindling the people of San Francisco, this leads into a direct conflict between himself and Daredevil. Because of the fact that, you know, Tony Stark is really just kind of turning a darker approach here, the idea is to basically start weeding out people that might try to defy him. And so what he does is he actually gathers the entire city of San Francisco, which is just an insane number of people, and actually says, hey, look, show up at this location at such and such, and you'll all get like a free sample of the whole extremist tech. Now, of course, this leads into a direct conflict with a guy, but of course, this again highlights another instance of what the armor is capable of in the sense that it can basically turn itself translucent. It can make it appear as though he's not covering his face, which he actually is. But this also shows us the darker lengths of Tony Stark. Remember, Tony Stark had always been a guy who was teetering on the edge. And for years and years and years and years, alcoholism was always a major part of his character. It was always this thing where it was like, if anything was going to bring the empire of Stark crashing down, it would be his addiction to alcohol. Now, of course, this really seemed to, to culminate in the Demon in a Bottle storyline. Fun fact, it wasn't until the final issue of the story that it was actually called Demon in a Bottle, where his alcoholism almost did cost him his entire company. But coming back from it all, it basically resulted in him kind of moving forward and trying to be a good guy. And so for the most part, while I wouldn't say he was like a humanitarian, he was certainly falling more in line with what a traditional hero should be, as opposed to the way he was before, which was more geared towards capitalism. And so because of this, this is a stark contrast, no pun intended, with how he used to be in the sense that now he basically tells this guy, look, your son literally ran up on a chick and tried to rob her. And so I can make this go away. The only thing you need to do is go down there and tell people 
that you agree with my ideas, my motivations, and extremist tech. Now, on the surface, it doesn't seem like a huge thing, but it is, because this is basically a superhero blackmailing a small-time guy just for the purpose of trying to make sure that the world believes that what he's doing is actually right, and that's why it's so nefarious. In the aftermath of this, and with Daredevil watching all of it unfold, it leads to him kidnapping Tony Stark. Now, of course, this is really Daredevil just trying to interrogate him. As soon as Stark wakes up, he immediately recalls his into Sim armor to himself, and then in turn, tells Daredevil, I'm giving you a gift. And this is one of the most mind-blowing moments of the story, because when Matt Murdock wakes up, what he ends up finding is that he can see he has his eyesight back. Now, this was a huge moment in the story, and it's really one of the biggest moments for Matt Murdock's character. And the reason for this is because his lack of eyesight has been the defining attribute of who he is as a person. In the comics, it was always a cornerstone of every writer who ever focused on Daredevil, how he deals with the world around him while simultaneously trying to be a blind superhero. And in fact, there were years and years and years and years when no one knew he was blind. And even now in the Marvel Universe, with the at the time this story was written, a large bulk of it don't don't know that he's blind. And so in this instance, with his blindness being one of the most defining attributes of his character, considering it's been part of his life since he was a child, it's been how he's learned to cope with the world, to suddenly have his eyesight back is this temporary gift. Now again, he's told by Tony Stark, you're not going to have it forever. It's a temporary thing. It's a very short thing, but I want you to experience this. I want you to see what the world is like and then ask yourself, are you really willing to give that up? Now, the other half of this is it really shows us how far gone Tony Stark has come when he basically says, look, that whole thing with Axis, the whole thing with the Red Skull, so on and so forth, that showed me who I truly am, that I've basically been dumbing myself down in order to make all of you out there feel like you're intelligent. Instead, why should I do that? And so he's run drunk on his own power, his own abilities, his own intelligence, so on and so forth. And so again, this is a pretty dark fall for his character because what this does is it leads into this quote unquote return of Teen Abomination. Teen Abomination basically breaks out of S.H.I.E.L.D. custody. And then when Iron Man shows up, he just kind of whisks him away and says, look, you know, I will take you under my wing. I'll basically try to help you as best I can. Now, this comes out of the fact with this revelation that Teen Abomination is actually just a 13-year-old kid. That's really all it is. He was just blasted with gamma radiation somewhere along the line, and that was really about it. But with Matt Murdock's character, again, this is one of the saddest moments because switching back to him, he goes and he sees Foggy Nelson because he just wants to see what he looks like with his own eyes. If only ever one time, if only ever for a brief moment, for a few seconds, he wants to see what he looks like. Of course, his eyesight fades away. He ends up going back to seeing the things the way he normally does. But this is a huge situation for Matt Murdock because it's this very tempting thing. Okay, I give in. Like, I, I will, I'll take my eyesight. I'll fall in line with a whole, you know, Stark ideology. I'll do whatever it takes in order to make sure that I can continue seeing. Literally sacrifice his role as a superhero in order to go back to being able to see again. And so continuing on with, with Tony Stark, this is when we start to get into this really nefarious aspect of his character and what's really going on with the extremist tech. In this instance, it's basically this idea that he has now implemented these cameras, so to speak, you know, the uh, iron drones, whatever it is that he calls them that are basically parading around the city of San Francisco. And because of this, what they're doing is they're watching everything everyone does all the time, basically declaring the place to be a crime-free zone. And so it's really Tony Stark setting himself up to be a dictator, becoming a villain. He's really just becoming a bad guy. And so in this moment when Matt Murdock basically makes his return on Tony Stark and essentially says, I'm not willing to take in my ability to see in order to fall in line with what it is that you do, I'm not okay with that. In return, Stark basically takes him prisoner and then wipes his mind, basically just takes away Matt Murdock's knowledge of everything that's happened over the course of the last day. So again, this is a huge moment. These are the kind of things that Tony Stark's doing now, wiping people's minds, spying on people all the time. It's very dictatorial. It's very bad guy. And so again, it's, it's interesting to see it happen because it's just such a change. But God, man, he is a total jerk. <laughs> he is a total bad guy. And so from here, what we end up doing is we actually pick up with a woman named Katrina. And this falls in with the whole origin to a degree of teen abomination, but it also falls in with the idea that Tony Stark has always had this under the surface. It's just now showing itself. In this instance, Katrina was basically in a relationship with Happy Hogan, essentially the assistant of Tony Stark. But in this scenario, there was a process that was being undertaken that involved gamma radiation, but the shielding for the lab was not what it needed to be. And so what they ended up doing was basically seeking out Tony Stark and saying, we need more money to improve this. And Tony Stark's response was no. It was basically, you're not going to 
get what you need, that money can be spent better elsewhere. And so when the whole experiment ended up taking place and it all went awry, things played out exactly like we thought it would. It resulted in Katrina being blasted with gamma radiation, her son being blasted with gamma radiation, which explains how Teen Abomination got his powers. But then it starts to fill things up a little bit more when we end up learning that in this instance with everything kind of going under with the whole project basically being scuttled by Stark Industries and Katrina being put out of work, that in the moment when, you know, her son asks for something that he can't get, he lashes out, he freaks out, and he in turn turns into Teen Abomination, destroys the house, and kills his mom. And so because of this, Tony Stark is effectively responsible for the creation of Teen Abomination and the death of Teen Abomination's mom. This also explains the whole backstory when it comes to Tony Stark's mind being backed up. And it's basically him talking about fighting a villain named Black Llama. But the idea was that when it runs over the whole event of him basically facing off against Black Llama and then ultimately having to back up his mind in the process, what we end up learning is that he essentially forgot everything that had happened. His mind had been wiped from the time that he arrived back home until whatever it is that happened the next day. And so what ends up happening is when he basically sends Teen Abomination off, when he says, yeah, sure, we'll get things sorted out, we'll get you returning back to normal, what he begins doing is asking the question, who wiped a day out of my mind? Who made me forget what it was that happened over the course of that day? And so that's where the second half of the story picks up. Who was it that screwed over Tony Stark? Who is it that wiped that day during his mind? And what was it that happened during this day? And of course, you know, how did things end up progressing over the course of Superior Iron Man? But with that being said, guys, we're gonna go ahead and bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comments Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like, and yeah, I will catch you all later. Peace.